campus of Brentwood Baptist Church, and thanks for being here this morning. If you're a first time or returning guest, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad you're here. We're going to begin the service in just a few minutes, but before we do, we want to tell you about some things happening around our church. If you didn't get a chance to attend our Christmas concert yesterday, there is still time to catch a performance. This afternoon at 3 and 6 p.m., our choir and orchestra will be presenting your favorite holiday carols along with new songs, dance performances, and more. This free performance is one you don't want to miss, so we hope to see you this afternoon. See your bulletin for details. Next Sunday, our Children's Marketplace Ministry will present Journey to Bethlehem. This special walkthrough Christmas experience brings the story of our Savior's birth to life. You'll hear from shepherds, innkeepers, and even see the baby Jesus. The experience is free, and it takes about 30 minutes to fully enjoy. Reservations are recommended, so see your bulletin for more details. Finally, we hope that you'll make plans to attend one of our Christmas Eve services. This year, we'll be hosting four candlelight services in the worship center, two during our regular worship hours of 9.30 and 11 a.m., and two later in the day at 3.30 and 5 p.m. We'll also hold a Lord's Supper service at 12.30 p.m. in Baskin Chapel. Be sure to bring your family and friends along with you to experience this special Christmas event. Thanks again for being with us this morning. We hope you have a great week. Now let's worship the Lord together. Oh, good morning. Welcome to worship at Brentwood today, inviting you to stand with us as we lift our voices together, singing our praise to the Lord. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And uh, today, fitting, we light the candle of joy. And for you will remain standing. And uh, today we have invited uh, Don and Shirley Whitley to come and light our candle of joy. And they're coming now through this maze. And as they light this candle, here's this scripture from Luke. In chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. 
And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful for this candle of joy. And you indeed bring us great joy this season and always as we are in relationship with you. Father, remind us of the joy that you are. Father, when we're in your word, when we're in prayer and praise and worship, of you. Father, you always bring a joy that can surpass our understanding and our circumstances. So thank you for this resounding joy that can only come from the person of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So good to see you for worship at Brentwood, and uh, glad that you're here this morning. It's been a wonderful weekend so far. If you've uh, been a part of our Christmas concerts, uh, the Lord has been with us, and it's been a glorious occasion. It's been my privilege uh, to lead a wonderful group of people that assembled together, and I hope if you have that your heart has been encouraged and you found a lot of joy in the Christmas concerts. It's not too late. You'll see the information on the inside of your bulletin when you came in. There's uh, concerts today at 3 and 6, so we encourage you you uh, to be a part of that. They're free and the doors open one hour prior to. So uh, don't miss this opportunity, uh, the unique opportunity for this church family uh, this season. If you're a guest with us, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you'll look there in the pew rack right in front of you, you'll notice there's a, a communication card. If you'll begin to fill that out as I'm talking with you now, we'd like to have a record of your visit today. Let us know how we can minister to you and come alongside you. And guess we want to tell you about something uh, called Next Steps. And uh, for this is really for everybody, not just for our guests. But today, uh, Pastor Mike, at the conclusion, uh, he's going to give you opportunity to respond uh, to the message today. And you might want to pick up that conversation you might want to know what it means to uh, be in relationship with the Lord or be, to be baptized or become a member of this church. We have counselors right out in our atrium, right out these doors and to the right, uh, ready to uh, receive you and talk about those things. So we encourage you to do that. And uh, guests, when you finish uh, filling out your card, just hold it. Later on in our service, we'll receive an offering. And guess if you'll place that offering plate. Uh, when it comes by, we'd so be glad to have that from you. So good to see you for worship today. Why don't we stand together now? Let's greet a guest and a neighbor. Tell them it's good to see them at Brentwood, and then we're going to continue to sing together. <laughs>
to him. Father, thank you for sending your son on the cross for us. So we live today because of your death, burial, and resurrection. We lift you to the highest place. We worship you. Let's live with you. of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used to his advantage 
Brother, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. you, Lord. Would you be seated and would turn your attention to the baptistry? Good morning, church family. I want to introduce you to my friend Ashley. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we met after the service, and um, Ashley had shared a little bit about her life and said, you know, I have gone to church all my life, but I have never received the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she's had some bumps in the road some abusive relationships. And she said, you know, I've been going to a life group and they've been praying for me for almost a year. And I realized that I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And so we prayed to ask Christ to come into her life. And she is joined with families and friends here today in the service. And, and she wants the world to know, and she wants you as a church family that Jesus Christ is now our Lord and Savior. Is that correct, yes, Ashley? Sir. So Ashley, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. For those of you who are paying attention, yes, we did skip the baptistry. It was supposed to be early in the service. We usually don't require that people soak um, <laughs> oh, hey, we could have been baptized, uh, you know, having baptism in the river. So, uh, so we're grateful for like modern heated pools. <laughs> I hate to break this moment of worship to take care of family business, but sometimes we have no choice. You were given a lot of information when you came in. Part of that information is the recommendation for the 2018 budget. And, and included in that presentation of the 2018 budget are some uh, bylaw changes and that kind of stuff that are coming to you uh, as a recommendation from the trustees, basically cleaning up how we do some business stuff in the church. Uh, all of that was printed in one thing, so we don't kill any more trees than we have to. Uh, but you were also given a ballot. There are two sides of that ballot. Make sure you fill out both sides. One side is to support uh, the, um, the budget, one side is uh, your response to uh, these uh, suggested uh, changes in the bylaws and such. So all of that is together. We'll vote on it this Sunday and next Sunday. So uh, if you will drop them in the wooden boxes on the way out, you'll find them by the doors. And, uh, and that way we can get uh, this information uh, recorded and, uh, and this business taken care of. This also gives me a chance to remind you that we vote on a budget twice. Uh, once when you vote on it, the other when you give to it. Uh, the budget is how we get things done. It's the way that we communicate to you the priorities of ministry and missions that we believe the Lord has laid out for us and how we will respond uh, to these opportunities. Uh, and, and things like uh, a friend of mine sent me uh, some, uh, some PR that we're now sending out about the Deaf Go Bible. Did you know that in the uh, App Store is a Bible for deaf people? It's called the Deaf Go Bible. 
And if you go to the App Store, you can download the Deaf Go Bible. It's a Bible that is done in American Sign Language for the deaf. And it's being used in Bible studies, churches, um, mission opportunities all around the world. And do you know that that Deaf Go Bible was recorded right here, right across the hall? Uh, there are uh, church plants going on in Middle Tennessee. There is a uh, medical uh, dental mission uh, uh, ministry van that goes out several times a year. Uh, on and on the stuff goes uh, about all the missions and ministries that we're doing, and it's all supported through your generosity and through the Lord's faithfulness in the, in, uh, the, in the budget process. So uh, the ushers will be coming forward here in the main sanctuary. If you join us in Overflow and Baskin Chapel, we welcome you, and the ushers will be coming there to serve you as well. So let's continue uh, our, uh, our worship of the Lord as we now give together. Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children. We give them with great enthusiasm uh, and excitement, uh, sure and grateful for what you have done in our life, eager to see what you will yet do. So receive the gifts that your children bring to you and use them in everything we are and everything we have. So that the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, is proclaimed from horizon to horizon. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Let there be light. With those four words, God breathed life into the darkness in the beginning. And it was those four words echoed in the cries of a baby boy on a silent night in Bethlehem that changed the world again. Let there be light. Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, the light of men. He came to breathe life into the darkness of our hearts. Let there be light. I guess every family has their traditions. And in my family, on Saturday morning, it was cartoon day. Uh, now, on Sunday morning, mom wouldn't let us watch cartoons. We had to watch the, all of the, of the old time gospel hour because it was Sunday, the Lord's Day. Couldn't watch cartoons. But on Saturday, you could watch cartoons. And there was no cartoon better than Popeye. Pie Pie the Sailor Man. Y'all remember him? Now, I, now I love the old, the, the old black and white with, with, with Pie Pie. And he was in love with olive oil. And, uh, you know, Bluto would always show up and mess him up. And, uh, and, and, and Pie, uh, Pie Pie was a long-suffering, patient man. But finally, Bluto would push him to the limit. And you would hear Pie Pie say, that's all I can stand. And I can't stand no more. And his little pipe would twirl in his mouth. And he would pull out his can of spinach and Bluto would be in for a bad day. Right? It was a great comic. You know, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. You've had that moment, haven't you? Where something has gotten on your last nerve, where the final straw has hit in the back of the proverbial candle and you said to yourself, that's it. I can't take anymore. I can't stand anymore. I've got to do something about this situation. This circumstance I am in is intolerable. That's all I can stand. And I can't stand no more. You do know that God himself has those moments, don't you? When he comes to a point that that's all he can stand. And he can't stand no more. Isaiah chapter 9 is about such a moment. Stand with me in honor of God's word. Nevertheless, 
The gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time, as they rejoice when dividing the spoils. You have shattered their oppressive yoke, the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did in the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel in the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on, upon his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, his prosperity will never end, and he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Things will not be like that of former times. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it. Believe it and live. Let's pray together. Like the people of Jerusalem in the days of Assyria, we feel surrounded and oppressed like just any minute we will be overrun and left for dead. But as your promise came to them, now let it, O oh Father, come to us of this child who will be born and change everything. And we pray this in your name. Amen. These were tough days for the nation of Israel. If you read the Old Testament, you are often surprised by how much combat there is in those, in those books, in those chapters. Uh, there is a lot of war, and one of the reasons that Israel was always either threatened by war or in war was the location of where God put His people. Uh, the location of the nation of Israel. If you look in the back of your Bible, you'll find a map of the nation of Israel or the kingdoms of Israel or the tribes of Israel or something like that. And the map will look something like this. If you pay attention, if you know anything about ancient history, you will understand that God put His people at the four-way stop of the world. Okay, all of the trade routes from what is now modern-day Iraq and Iran, Babylon... Uh, came from the, e from the east to the west toward Egypt. All of the trade route from Egypt to what is now modern-day Turkey and from modern-day Turkey back to Egypt came north to south through Israel. You had to go either by the way of the sea, which is, uh, which is uh, Naphtali, and definitely that was where those nations were, uh, and that's where that trade route was, or you would go down between the mountains through the River Jordan. And if you look at a map... Uh, you will see a lot of the times that the armies were trying to, con uh, to conquer Israel because they wanted to control the trade routes of the world. If you control the, the four-way stop of the world here, then you could control what goods got to whom, uh, what goods got where. You could tax those goods, and it would be uh, synonymous, the same thing as uh, controlling the Panama Canal. Uh, this was where everything that was anything came. And it came right through there. So it, it was very strategic. If you wanted to, to control the world, you had to control the trade routes. And you had to control the four-way stop, which is where Israel was. Now, tiglath Pileser, isn't that a fabulous name? <laughs> tiglath Pileser was the king of Assyria. And Tiglath-Pileser was doing what kings do, and he was expanding his territory. He had already invaded the northern area of Israel. He had already conquered Galilee. He was coming down by the way of the sea. He was coming down the coastline on his way to Jerusalem. He surrounds Jerusalem. 
Israel prays to God. God promises that Jerusalem will be delivered, and Jerusalem is delivered. Tiglath-Pileser, in his own writing, says that he had Jerusalem wrapped up like a bird in a cage. What he never says is that he reached in the cage and grabbed the bird. He surrounded Jerusalem, laid siege to Jerusalem, but Tiglath-Pileser never conquered Jerusalem. Jerusalem never failed. If you'll read the stories, you will find a story of a group of beggars who discovered that overnight, mysteriously, the Assyrian army had gone back to Assyria. Now, there's a lot of um, discussion among scholars about why this, why this came. They, either there was a threat to Tiglath-Pileser's throne back home, so he packed up and left, or there is some thinking that the plague bro uh, broke out among the army. Uh, the Assyrian army that had surrounded Jerusalem. Now, you have to remember sanitation conditions were not what they are now. Uh, and we have some historical writings where some of the uh, history writers tell us that rats ate the bowstrings of the Assyrians. And that kind of gives us some indication that there may have been a rat infestation. The rats would have carried the fleas that carried the plague. The Assyrian army would have gotten sick, panicked, and left. And much to these beggars' surprise, they find everything left behind, and they find food, and they find clothing, and they return to Jerusalem and sell, tell Jerusalem that the Assyrian army is gone, trapped like a bird in a cage. But Tiglath-Pileser never grabbed that bird. And so now in this time of great distress and trouble, the prophet Isaiah stands up and says, good news, God has heard our prayers. He's going to answer them. Great. Tell us the plan. A baby's going to be born. Okay, let, let's, let's put all this aside. Let's just you and me talk just a minute. Okay, we're, we're old friends now. Let's just get, okay, now get this. You're standing on the walls of Jerusalem. You can see the smoke from the enemy's camp. You can literally look out and see them. You know how ugly this army is. Uh, for sport, the Assyrians used to chop off the legs and arms of people. Okay? Throw them in the middle of the camp and watch them flop around. And that was the evening's entertainment. Now, you know that that's the army that is out there. You know the threat that they bring to your family, what they'll do to your wife, what they'll do to your children, what they'll do to you. And you're praying that God will deliver you. And Isaiah, a trusted prophet, shows up and says, God will deliver us. Great. What's the plan? A baby. No disrespect, Isaiah, but would you go back to God and tell him we need tanks? Okay. We, we, we need something other than a baby. Babies are beautiful. Babies are cute. But babies can't do anything. How in the world is a baby going to save us? What is this baby going to do? Well, remember, God's ways are not our ways. Uh, one of the things that frustrated the people about Jesus is everybody knew how to save the world. Everybody had a plan. And Jesus wouldn't do their plan. Right? Jesus would show up here and he would ask us, what, and he, what do you think I need to do? And we would tell him, this is what you need to do, Jesus. Here are the people you need to go after. And he wouldn't do any of that. And we would be really frustrated with him. We know how to save the world. But he won't follow our plan. This is a baby that is born, but it's unlike any other baby the world has ever seen. This baby is born with authority. This baby is born with power. We've all had those conversations, haven't we, where we have diagnosed some problem in the world, some problem in our nation, and we have said, you know what we need to do? This is what we need to do. And it is a good answer. It is probably the right answer. And if we could find some way to implement it, it would work. But nobody here has the authority to get it done. Nobody has the power to get it done. This is just not the government of Israel that rests on this child. It is the government of heaven that rests on this child. This power, this child has the power and the authority to do what needs to be done. 
and he can do it any way it needs to be done. I used to tell my boys when, when they were little and they would test me, which happens every now and then when you have boys. And I would sit them down at the table and I would say, guys, I love you. I love being your dad. And I hope I can be a dad who encourages you. I can be a dad who supports you. But if I need to be a dad that brings the hammer of Thor on you, I can do that too. I can be whatever kind of dad you need me to be. Now just tell me what kind of dad I need to be. I love you enough, I'll be whoever you need me to be. Jesus loves us enough, he'll be the savior that we need him to be. Wonderful counselor. Have you ever been in the presence of a great counselor? I mean, I was privileged when I was in school that most of the guys who wrote the books, uh, most of uh, uh, the ladies who wrote the books about theology and, and, and counseling in the church were my professors. They were my teachers. And you would sit with them and you would talk with them and they had this amazing ability to create this safe space where you could talk about what was going on in your life. Ray, Wade Rowett, uh, who was a longtime professor of pastoral care, wrote several of the books, did Jeannie and my uh, uh, premarital counseling. I'm still angry at him. He took Jeannie's side every time. I don't know why that happens. Um, but you would sit with Wade, and he would create this wonderful, safe space where you could unpack your junk and know that you're not going to be condemned you're not going to be judged. You're going to have a safe place to deal with it, to identify it, let go of what you need to let go of, hold on, fix what you can. You're going to be able to do all of that because he'll create that safe kind of space. I, I, I hurt for some of you because you have such a limited and shallow understanding of prayer. You think it's a time you drop by and tell Jesus what's going on, but you never stay there long enough. You never sit there to understand that what happens in the quietness and the peace when Jesus is your counselor and he creates this wonderful space for you to deal with your junk. Sometimes, sometimes you don't say what you need to say to Jesus because you're afraid you'll surprise him. Right? You're afraid that, you, you know, that if you bring up something, he's going to say, Oh, I didn't know that. I don't know where I was, but please, I missed that. Tell me. Fill me in the details. No. Nothing's going to surprise him. Nothing's going to catch him off guard. You can deal with your stuff. There's a, uh, there's a, and and, and, and we're, we are very fortunate as, as a church to have several good counselors on our team. Ken Core is a fabulous counselor. Uh, Gail Haywood, wonderful counselor. Uh, and if you've got some stuff you need to unpack, they do it great. I'm not one. Okay, when, when we do the spiritual gift assessment, we do mercy, I have none. Okay, I don't. And it looks like the bottom of the graph. In fact, they always go back and check it and say, well, you must have missed these questions. No, I didn't miss them. I just don't have that. Okay. Because you don't always need a wonderful counselor, okay? And, and, and I'm okay with that. I, you know, I, and, and we, people come and see me and they say, hey, here's what's going on, Mike. And I say, well, Lord knew you didn't need mercy. He would have sent you somewhere else. He would have sent you down the hall to Gail or to Ken. I'm the guy who says, I hate what happened to you. I hate your dad did that. I hate that happened to you. I hate your mom did that. I hate what happened to you. But that's what happened. Now what are we going to do with it? Sometimes you don't need a wonderful counselor. Sometimes you need a mighty God. Sometimes you need someone to tell you, I don't care what they did. You're never given permission to disobey. You're never given permission not to do what you know to do. You are not victim because somebody else did something to you. The power of the resurrection gives you a choice. And gives you the power and authority not to overcome that I know sometimes you don't feel like forgiving, right? Somebody did something to you. Somebody hurt you. Somebody betrayed you, right? And, and if there's a hell, these people need to be first in line. 
I don't feel like forgiving. You're not asked if you feel like it. You're told to do it. I'm told to do it. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Forgive. Why? Because that's the way Jesus deals with you. And that's the way you deal with him. Mighty God, I can be strong enough. God says, I can be the Savior who tells you. This is the way it is for you. Everlasting Father. You know, we were told for a long time that dads had no place in their children's life. It, was, it didn't matter if you had a dad or not. Men really didn't matter. And we're reaping a bitter harvest of that lie now. And we're finding out that daughters find in their fathers their first boyfriends. That they will look for someone to treat them the same way that they see their father treat their mother. And if that is absent, then they'll search the world for another kind of dad. Sons, when they don't know how else to act, will act just like their dads. Okay, now I know when you're 12 or 13, you got a long list. I'm never going to act like my dad. I'm never going to do this. But when you get in a, when you get in a tight, you're going to act just like them. Okay? My dad had this thing of rubbing his hands when he got excited. Okay? He'd walk into the store. He'd feel good. All right, son, today's going to be a good day. All right? <laughs> So one day I walk into the house with the boys. I say, boys, today it's like, ah. <laughs> I've turned into my dad. And, and now here's the thing. I didn't ever go off and, and, and practice that. Okay? I just watched it. I just saw it. So that it became who I am. You are not an orphan. Amen. You have a father. You have a name. You have an identity that the father gave to you that the world can't take you away from. They can, you have a standard that you live up to simply because you are a child of the king. My dad always used to tell me, son, this is the way a Glen acts. You act this way. I don't care what everybody else does. You are a Glen. You're different. I thought our name was royalty from Europe. <laughs> right? I thought if I did the, the background that I would find castles and knights and coats of armor, only to find out we we're white trash sharecroppers from South Mississippi. <laughs> I didn't. My dad said you're a gland. Glands don't do that. This is the way you act. Don't let anybody mistreat you or discount you. You are a gland. You are somebody. There is a standard you have. This is the way you act. This is the way you live because you are a child of the king. You have a standard of how you are treated and how you allow the world to interact with you because you are a child of the king. You're not going to let anybody discount you. You're not going to let anybody take your name away from you. You're not going to let anybody rob you of the identity that you have given to you in Christ Jesus. You are a child of the king, everlasting father. Amen. Prince of peace. Now, some of you think peace is the absence of war. And you hear the talk about the Middle East peace process. And maybe if we can just get those people to quit shooting at each other, maybe we can have peace. That is a far cry from what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about shalom, wholeness, completeness, health. Sometimes you try to go to sleep and you can't. Because of the storm that's going on in your head. Maybe the decision's too hard for you. Maybe the decision's too confusing for you. Maybe you can't find the right answer. And you toss and you turn, trying to find a way just to get some sleep. If you could just have a few moments of peace. And just like Jesus said to the water and the wind and the boat with the disciples, be still. 
you'll hear Jesus step into the storm of your life and say, hush, be quiet, you're okay. There's no wind strong enough. There's no wave big enough to tip over your little boat. You're okay. Go to sleep. Sometimes life will hit you so hard, it will take the breath out of your lungs. The news will come, and you won't be able to breathe. In fact, your friends around you will sit down and put their arm around you and say, breathe, breathe. It will hit you that hard. And you will close your eyes and say, this time it's too hard. This time I can't do it. Be still. You're okay. Prince of Peace. And when we started thirking through this morning, we realized that some of you would need to spend some time with the Savior who loves you enough to be whatever kind of Savior he needs. That's why we've saved the prayer time to now. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to put both feet on the floor. Okay? I don't want your ankles crossed. I don't want your legs crossed because your foot will go to sleep, and that's what you'll be thinking about in the middle of your prayer time. I want you to let your hands relax in your lap. And I want you to close your eyes. The only reason I want you to close your eyes so you're not distracted by anything going on around you, so you can focus on your own life. And I just want you to breathe. Now I know how every prayer is supposed to start. I know you begin with adoration. I know you begin with praise. I know that leads you to thanksgiving and that leads you uh, to gratitude, and that leads you to, to intercession. I, I know all of that. But we only have a handful of minutes this morning. So who is it that you need Jesus to be for you right now? Wonderful counselor? Do you have some stuff in your life that you just need to put out and just, just work through it, look at it without fear of being condemned, without fear of being judged? And the safety of his love for you. He loves you enough to be your wonderful counselor. Or maybe this time, God is calling you to some challenge, to climb some high mountain, and you have resisted because this calling is too hard. This one is above you. This one is more than you have. And you need a Savior who is a mighty God who says, let's go. Make your stand. Maybe the world has stolen your identity from you. And you don't know who you are anymore. And now in this moment, the Father reminds you, you are His. He gave you your name. He knows who you are. You are his. He gave you his name. So that everybody knows. 
choose who you belong to. Prince of Peace. I know the storm is dark. I know the winds are strong. But our Savior commands the wind and the waves. He's the captain of your boat. You're okay. And maybe for some of you, this is the scariest moment of your life. You were hoping that we would sing a lot, stand up and sit down a lot today because the last thing you want is this kind of quiet moment where you can actually hear what Jesus is saying to you. You've been running, you've been hiding, you've been trying to get away from him all your life and now he's here. But understand, he is not here to condemn you, to judge you. He's here to rescue you. It's not anger that is on his face. It is desperation. Now I know the only thing you're thinking of right now is all that you have lost. All the mistakes you've made. All the things you can't get back. You want to pull me aside and say, Mike, it can't be that easy. Mike, you just don't understand. Oh, do not hear, do not hear me say that it is easy. Hear me say that it is an impossible. Christ has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. He bore on the cross the payment for our sins, our failures. His resurrection gives you a second chance, an opportunity for a life you didn't even know was possible, but is yours as his gift to you. Now, I know I'm saying a whole lot. That's why our friends, our counselors, our pastors are out at a, at a table and you'll see a big sign that says, next step. Whatever it is, whatever Christ is calling you to be part of our church family, to come and follow him as your Lord and Savior, whatever it is, he's waiting for you right where you are our church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. So we pray that the choices we make now are exactly what you want. Would you stand with me? Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me my song to rise to you when 
temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Today. Your next steps are right out these doors and to your right. God bless you as you go.